Shalom, my friends. Thank you for joining our podcast today. We appreciate you. Uh, Today, we're going to be discussing a topic that I have selected from our reading material for this two-week period. Uh, Our reading material covers 2 Nephi chapters 3 through 10. But before I I begin, I kind of need to set a stage for this topic that I have selected. Probably the best way to do it is with kind of a timeline. Well, it was Sunday, April the 5th, 1829, when Oliver Cowdery knocked on the front door of Joseph and Emma Smith's home in Harmony, Pennsylvania. And a short two days later, by April the 7th, Oliver had begun his divine calling as scribe for Joseph. He began the translation where Joseph and Martin Harris had left off, which would be approximately Messiah chapter 2. By June 1st of 1829, Joseph and Oliver had translated all through to Moroni chapter 10. They began the translation, uh, as I mentioned, on June 1st, and two months later, they had completed basically what uh, Mormon had abridged in the large plates of Nephi. At this point, with uh, that portion completed, uh, Joseph and Oliver departed for the Peter Whitmer farm in Fayette, New York, to complete the remainder of the translation process. And it would be at the Whitmer farm that Joseph and Oliver would translate the small, unabridged plates of Nephi. And that would take a month to translate. So basically, three months is what it took to translate the Book of Mormon as we have it today. But the question might be asked, why were these unabridged small plates of Nephi included by Mormon? And the answer to that question is actually found in the book entitled The Words of Mormon. In Words of Mormon 1, 6, and 7, it says, But behold, I shall take these plates which contain these prophecies and revelations and put them with the remainder of my record for they are choice unto me, and I know they will be choice unto my brethren. And I do this for a wise purpose, for thus it whispereth me according to the workings of the Spirit of the Lord which is in me. And now I do not know all things, but the Lord knoweth all things which are to come, wherefore he worketh in me to do according to his will. The answer to that question, why were the small plates included by Mormon? For a wise purpose. And I do this for a wise purpose. The small plates of Nephi were to replace, of course, the book of Lehi, or the 116 pages that were lost by Martin Harris. It basically covers the same time period. As such, the Book of Mormon begins with the unabridged translation of the small plates of Nephi, replacing, as I said, the book of Lehi. Well, now now to my point. By early June, Joseph is translating the small plates of Nephi. He is translating in the book of 2 Nephi, which is our reading material. He is translating material that is written in 570, 570 B.C., material that's over 2,600 years old. He comes across the following verses as Lehi is near death and about to offer his dying blessing to his youngest son, Joseph. In 2 Nephi chapter 3, verses 3-6 through 6, and 13-15, through 15, it says the following, And now, Joseph, my last born, whom I have brought out of the wilderness of mine affliction, may the Lord bless thee forever, for thy seed shall not utterly be destroyed. For behold, thou art the fruit of my loins, and I am a descendant of Joseph, who was carried captive into Egypt. And great were the covenants of the Lord which he made unto Joseph. Wherefore Joseph truly saw our day, and he obtained a promise of the Lord, that out of the fruit of his loins the Lord God would raise up a righteous branch unto the house of Israel." not the Messiah, but a branch which was to be broken off, nevertheless to be remembered in the covenants of the Lord, that the Messiah should be made manifest unto them in the latter days, in the spirit of power, and unto the bringing of them out of darkness into light, yea, of hidden darkness, and out of captivity unto freedom." 
For Joseph truly testified, saying, A seer should the Lord my God raise up, who shall be a choice seer unto the fruit of my loins. Now imagine, you're Joseph Smith, as you translate now, line upon line, these following verses. And out of weakness he shall be made strong in that day when my work shall commence among all the people unto the this restoring thee, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. And thus prophesied Joseph, saying, Behold, that seer will the Lord bless, and they that seek to destroy him shall be confounded. For this promise which I have obtained of the Lord, of the fruit of my loins, shall be fulfilled. Behold, I am sure of the fulfilling of this promise. And his name shall be called after me, and it shall be after the name of his father, and he shall be likened to me, for the things which the Lord shall bring forth by his hand, by the power of the Lord shall bring my people unto salvation. Wow, I cannot even imagine what must have been going through Joseph Smith's mind as he translated these verses to see his own name literally in print in 570 B.C. Well, because of this particular verse that is a part of our reading assignment, I started to ponder what other scriptures in the Bible, or the Book of Mormon for that matter, allude to the prophet Joseph Smith, or the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. This is going to be the topic of our podcast today, these, these particular scriptures. In particular, I might reference scriptures from the Old Testament. So, let us begin. Some materials that I'm going to reference today and present to you is research that's been done by Joseph Fielding McConkie, son of Bruce R. McConkie, and a fellow named George A. Horton, an associate professor of ancient scripture at BYU. Let me preface my thoughts on this topic first by quoting from 1 Nephi chapter 13, verse 28 that there are many plain and precious things taken away from the book, which is the book of the Lamb of God. Well, I am totally convinced that the ancients saw our day and knew of our prophets just as well as we can see their day and know of their prophets. As we know, Adam and Enoch and Noah, Abraham and Moses, so they knew also Joseph Smith. Peter said, whom the heavens must receive until the time of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Well, here Peter is saying that the holy prophets knew that there would be a restoration of all things prior to the second coming, and that Joseph Smith would be the means of initiating such a restoration. I like what Wilford Woodruff had to say. He said, there was not one of the ancient prophets who did not see and prophesy about the great Zion of God in the last days. Their revelations and prophecies all point to our day and that great kingdom of God which was spoken of by Daniel, by Isaiah, and Jeremiah. From the days of Father Adam to the last prophet of past dispensations has come a mighty flood of prophecy, which, like a strong band, has surrounded the prophet Joseph Smith, dictating the great work that he would do. At Adam on Diamond, Father Adam stood in the midst of his congregation, although bowed down with age, and predicted whatsoever should befall his posterity unto the last generation. These prophecies of Adam were preserved in the book of Enoch. Now, we don't have the book of Enoch as such today. Joseph Smith, however, did preserve a portion of the record of Enoch, and that portion of the record of Enoch is found in the book of Moses. And I want to reference verse 62 of chapter 7. He says, and again, this is, this is Enoch, and righteousness will I send down out of heaven, and truth will I send forth out of the earth. Truth will I send forth out of the earth to bear testimony of my only begotten. Well, that's the Book of Mormon. To gather out mine elect from the four quarters of the earth. Well, that's the gathering. And it shall be called Zion, a new Jerusalem, 
Obviously, we're alluding here to the building of the New Jerusalem in Jackson County, Missouri. There's a, another apocryphal book that has to do with Enoch. It is referred to as, as the Hebrew book of Enoch or third or third book of, of Enoch. And in this particular book, it actually mentions the name of the Latter-day prophet who would be involved in all of these events that uh, I've just talked about in Moses chapter 7. His name is Joseph. He is referred to as Messiah ben Joseph, meaning the anointed son of Joseph. When Joseph of Egypt was near death, he assembled his family around him, and he said, I die. The aged prophet then prophetically unfolded the events that lay in the future of Israel. And he spoke of Israel being delivered in the last days by a heavenly servant. From the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis chapter 50 verse 33, we read the following, I will remember you from generation to generation, and his name shall be called Joseph, and it shall be after the name of his father, and he shall be like unto you, meaning Joseph of Egypt, for the things which the Lord shall bring forth by his hand shall bring my people unto salvation. We've alluded to this scripture once before. Well, this prophecy came again by way of the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis chapter 50. We don't know exactly when this prophecy was lost to Israel. However, we know it existed during the days of Isaiah, which would be 700 B.C., and Jeremiah, 600 B.C., because this is the same time period, basically, of Lehi and his family when they obtained the brass plates of Laban, which contained this very prophecy. Lehi repeated much of this prophecy to his son Joseph. And if you want to read further about that, I would reference you to Second Nephi chapter 3, verses 6 through 15. This would be Lehi's uh, version of this particular prophecy. Well, no Bible prophet has had more to say about the restoration of the gospel and about the gathering initiated by the prophet Joseph than Isaiah. In Isaiah 11, he speaks of the gathering in some imagery of a stem, a rod, and a root. Isaiah tells us that the Messiah will come from the house of Jesse as a stem. The rod is a servant in the hands of Christ, who is partly a descendant of Jesse, as well as Ephraim, on whom is given much power. Now the root, the root, is representative of the priesthood of God. There's no question in my mind that the rod and the root are describing none other than the prophet Joseph Smith. In Doctrine and Covenants section 86, verses 8 and 9, we're told that Joseph held the right to the priesthood and that the keys of the kingdom had been conferred upon him. He would be the ensign to which the nations of the earth would gather. And then, then again, in Isaiah 29, he tells us of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. And he says, For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which, is, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered unto him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouths, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their hearts from me, their fear towards men is taught by the precepts of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind, out of obscurity and out of darkness. Well, this is, this is the Book of Mormon, and we know who, what this incident or 
or uh, scripture is alluding to, and that's uh, when Martin Harris went and tried to have the book looked at by the learned, and uh, he would not, uh, he would not bless it because it was sealed and not with him at the time. And so Charles Anthon backed away from it, and uh, it was later taken, of course, by an unlearned individual, and the words were brought forth. And of course, we're talking about Joseph Smith. Now, if you want a more meaningful, detailed version of what Isaiah has just talked to us about here, then I would recommend that you open your scriptures to Second Nephi chapter 27 and read what, uh, what, is, what the Book of Mormon has to say about this particular, uh, these particular scriptures. In Isaiah chapter 49, it describes Joseph Smith and his role as that great prophet of the Latter-day Restoration. You have to excuse me for all the scriptures in our podcast today, but uh, boy, Isaiah had a lot to say about our prophet. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of my people. Well, that is, uh, that is Joseph Smith. That is his legacy and, uh, and that is what he was to accomplish. And again, the importance of this particular scripture of Isaiah 49 can be rehearsed again in 1 Nephi chapter 21, verses 3 through 6 and 8. Again, we're finding these important scriptures of Isaiah talking about Joseph Smith, the gathering, coming forth of the Book of Mormon, being repeated again by Jacob and Nephi in our Book of Mormon. I find it fascinating that the verbiage that Isaiah use, uses in Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 3, where he talks about this, this servant of his coming with a mouth like a sharp sword. He says, uh, And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand he hid me, and made me a polished shaft in his quiver hath he hid me. And then in Doctrine and Covenants 6, verse 2, we find Joseph is that sword. Give heed unto my words, which is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, to the dividing asunder of both joints and marrow. Therefore give heed unto my words. Well, Joseph said, I am a huge rough stone rolling, and the only polishing that I get rubbed off is when I come in contact with something else, striking with accelerated force. Thus I will become a smooth and polished shaft, as Isaiah has said, in the quiver of the Almighty. Well, let's move on to a contemporary of, of Lehi, and that would be the prophet Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 21, and I'm quoting here from the Message Bible. It's not the King James Version, but it's another uh, of, the, uh, of the Bible uh, translations that says, And their prince will come from their own ranks. One of their own people shall be their ruler. The ruler will come from their own ranks, and I'll grant him free and easy access to me. Well, this passage clearly promises a single leader will be brought into the presence of the Lord and assume the presiding role in the Latter-day Gathering of Israel. In Jeremiah 31, 6 through 12, Jeremiah prophesies of the Latter-day Saints westward trek to the tops of the mountains when he said, For there shall be a day that the watchmen upon the Mount Ephraim shall cry, Arise ye, and let us go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. In Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 6 and 7, Ezekiel prophesies of two sticks. One stick representing the Bible, and that would be the stick of Judah, and the other, the Book of Mormon, the stick of Joseph, or Ephraim. 
I find this fascinating that recent archaeological research has revealed that the word stick in, in Hebrew refers to a wooden folding writing tablet. Well, the prophet Joseph recognized the stick's representation long before the discoveries of modern archaeology. Malachi also prophesied of the prophet Joseph Smith's role as the forerunner in the latter days when he said, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. So all of these Old Testament scriptures alluding to the prophet Joseph Smith or even calling him by name. So, so I pose the question, what's in a name? Why, why Joseph? The prophecy of Jacob's son to uh, the prophecy of Jacob's son Joseph that the latter day seer would bear his name and it would also be the name of his father, I think is really very, very significant. In biblical times, as well as today in Israel, names are given to signify uh, special events, to identify a position or rank, or even to foreshadow the destiny of an individual. My friends in Israel have named, for example, their children after mighty trees, trees that grow and prosper um, in Israel. Well, the definition of the word Joseph in Hebrew is the Lord addeth, or he that gathers, or he who causes to return. Now this name seems very appropriate in describing Joseph's divinely calling. And interestingly enough, Joseph's brother Hiram name, his tr name translates to my brother is exalted. I think that's also very appropriate. Well, in conclusion, I want to share with you what Joseph Fielding Smith said about uh, our prophet Joseph Smith. He said, if a person thinks that the name Joseph Smith ought to be found in the Bible spelled out in so many letters, he will search in vain. Nevertheless, if we search the scriptures with an eye of faith, we will discover that the Lord truly did foretell the coming of this great Latter-day prophet, Joseph Smith. Now, this concludes our podcast today, our emphasis being again on the scriptures that prophesy of our Latter-day prophet, Joseph Smith, as well as the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and the gathering of Israel. I hope you've enjoyed our time together, and I look forward to our next podcast where we will be discussing materials found in 2 Nephi's chapters 11 through 25, that would be weeks 9 and 10 in your manual. And as I've started to prepare for our next podcast, and again, because of the continued emphasis on what Isaiah is saying, our podcast will be about Isaiah, an effort to get to know this prophet a little better and understand his works a little more thoroughly. Thanks again for joining me.